Aloha, and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Ewan. Our sponsor is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, which is a program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. I'm really pleased to welcome our guest today, Miles Topping. Miles is the Director of Engineering Management for the University of Hawaii. And today, Miles is going to provide us with an update on the UH Net Zero program. They've made a heck of a lot of progress. Miles, uh, welcome to the show. And uh, tell us about your program and how it's going. Yeah, thanks, Mitch. Great to be here again. Um, things are going good. We are uh, um, making some progress since the last time uh, we, we talked. And uh, really um, happy and excited to present this. This was presented to the state legislature a few months ago. It was also presented to our Board of Regents. We do an annual briefing and it is updated um, uh, every year and it looks back on the last fiscal year. So um, this will be looking back on fiscal year FY1920. We're still collecting and assembling the data for fiscal year FY2021. The fiscal year for the University of Hawaii extends from July 1st to June 30th. So, um, and it takes the other the divisions a little bit of time to get me the data so I can publish it for these reports. So it's a little bit historical, but um, I cover some of the, uh, anyway, let's get into the, to the, to the data and it, it, uh, people find it interesting. Sure. So, okay, here's my first slide, next slide. So yeah, so we have a, a mandate uh, put out by the, uh, the Hawaii Revised Statute that um, dictates that UH will become net zero by 2035. And uh, this is sort of our progress. The donut at the top explains that we've achieved 5.9% and a remaining of 94%, which is kind of not super encouraging. But you can see the rate of change from the last fiscal year report to this fiscal year report is very encouraging. And these are kilowatt hours produced, not necessarily systems that were construction, constructed or in construction, which some of you may have seen uh, you know, at Kapilani and at uh, some of the other community colleges, some of these big parking structures that we'll talk about later. But this is actual kilowatt hours produced against that goal. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, the result is that uh, we have, um, you know, reduced the uh, amount of energy that we purchase from the utility and we have increased uh, the amount of energy that we produce from renewables. Um, the site's pretty self-explanatory. It's, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're buying less and we're producing more. The so next slide, please. Uh, there, there's a dashboard uh, that we publish all of this information on. It's, uh, the, the last two slides were from uh, that dashboard. And, um, the, the URL is kind of at the bottom of that slide and we can make it available, uh, but it's at hawaii.edu slash sustainability. You can find the energy dashboard and uh, you can see all of these charts there, which are again, updated annually. And you can see that we are, you know, increasing our capacity where we've got increased energy efficiency that we're, you know, we're changing light bulbs to LEDs or we're optimizing, um, air conditioning run times. Um, we're doing uh, all sorts of efficiency measures across the system and you can see the, the results um, right there, up there on the on the slide. And like I said, you can go to hawaii.edu slash sustainability and peruse all this, all right. this information yourself. Next slide. Yeah, I love showing this chart because um, it shows the amount of installed capacity across the university system. Uh, you know, a lot of people, are not aware that we have this much PV installed across the state of Hawaii at the University of Hawaii at all of our different facilities. Next slide, please. So, you know, we start, if, if we break down where all the energy is getting consumed across all the different campuses, we kind of lump all the community colleges together up there in the table. And then we have um, you know, all of Manoa, all of Hilo and West Oahu. And we, I have to mention that uh, Manoa uh, affiliation. When you're affiliated to Manoa, like it includes things like um, the Waikiki Aquarium. Who knew? Uh, the Lion Arboretum. You know, who knew? There's um, Institute for Astronomy locations that are on outer islands that are affiliated to Manoa. And so that's, you know, 
the, the Monroe affiliation is huge. Uh, and if you, the, the bar chart there, so that's, that's sort of the, the blue pie chart is all the Manoa affiliation. And 80% um, of that pie chart is consumed right at Manoa main campus. And the bar chart there at the bottom kind of breaks down um, uh, the numbers at the top. And you can see how each of the community colleges, West Oahu and um, Hilo uh, stack up against uh, Manoa's consumption. It looks a little blurry in the slide, but uh, the big bar is Manoa. Is Manoa, so that's that's just to put that in context. Okay, next slide, please. So, uh, just uh, to interject, Manoa also uh, has a lot of uh, dorms and and accommodations. Uh, you know, big uh, uh, food courts. Uh, you know, dining facilities, uh, gymnasiums. So you have a lot of energy users on the on the campus. It's not just people in classrooms. It's all the supporting activities that go on at the university to you know to make everything work. That's, that's absolutely right, and that's also a little known fact is that you know uh, Manoa is not like a, a Department of Education school. It doesn't close for the summer, uh, and it has research that goes 24/7, 365. It's actually an R1 research university. And if you bring up the next slide, there's a little graphic that goes along with exactly the point that you were pointing out, is that uh, it's, it's, it's huge, it's massive. And I kind of made a collage of all these buildings that include research buildings, you know, housing buildings, uh, federal uh, government occupied buildings, um, things like that. And we, we are an R1 research facility with more than 18 research buildings. We have 17 housing buildings on campus. We have three libraries, which are also huge energy users, uh, a data centers. You know, the IT center, which houses a lot of state data is on our campus. And many of these buildings have to be cooled 24 seven research. If it's a research building, uh, you know, it needs to be climate controlled, which means it needs to meet a certain humidity and temperature requirement for a lab space. And if you have one lab space in a building, Building's a research building and it runs 24 7. Libraries have a tighter humidity and temperature uh, tolerance than human. Libraries, books will develop mold if they're left out. You ever wonder why you walk into a library and it's freezing cold? Is because they have super cooled the air to get all the moisture out. Um, and that's an expensive uh, endeavor is to, um, you know, house books. Um, these are rare books. These are, these are, uh, you know, we have a rare book treatment facility in the Hamilton phase three. Uh, we have uh, precious, just, just volumes of precious knowledge uh, housed in these, in these libraries. And like I said, IT centers per square foot, nothing consumes more than an IT center. It's just, it's just crazy. The yeah. computers are whirring and you have to cool them. They're emitting heat. You have to cool them down so they don't explode or whatever. And uh, yeah, it's just the energy intensive um, sense of thing. So the bottom line, if you look at that uh, last slide that we put up, you know, uh, the university is an, uh, Manoa Main Campus is an intensive operation. And at any point in time, you know, the, the notional population is about 20,000 people. It, there's like, right. you know, the enrollment, like 18,000 students and staff is like 5,000 people. And so at any, moment in time and you don't notice it when you walk around because it's so big it's so many square feet in there but there's 20,000 people there you know right. at any given time so that's something that is often not remembered and it's it, we consume about as much as 20,000 homes which is funny so um and we have ongoing research so, so we're actually doing pretty good and the, and, the, and the other factor is that you got 20,000 people who have different habits some people turn the lights off and turn their power bars off and their computers off, and other people just don't seem to be, seem to be oblivious of the yeah. amount of energy they use or cause to be used. You know, they leave the doors open. You know, all sorts. That's of things. my favorite. In, in the mainland, we have we have heat, right? You have to heat in the mainland, and so people are very uh, conscious about leaving the door open because it gets cold inside, right? So they keep the doors closed. But uh, here in Hawaii, we've always had trade winds. We've always had open door policy and stuff like that. So we leave our doors open. But what we don't realize is that that air conditioning air is just bleeding out and air conditioning the island, not uh, the space that is 
designed to. So it's working overtime when, when we do that. Um, but you're right. So, so uh, maybe bring up the next slide. Yeah, so this is an eye chart. Um, I'm not going to get into this too much, but we have um, different electrical services and uh, the main, all the blue buildings that you see at the main campus are fed, fed by what's called the substation. So that's where most of this energy is being consumed through is that substation. And you can see sort of the blue bar on the, on the left compared to the purple bar on the right. But uh, next slide. So when, if I just look at those, that substation, and I plot the most energy usage day, like one day over a generic 24 hour period. So I have the, the day that we use the most, the day that we use the least, and a few other statistically significant days. Um, this is those, uh, those five sort of statistically significant days overlaid onto a ge generic 24 hour period. And you can see here that usually that our consumption follows, uh, it's, it's seasonal. Like, why is it so high in September? It's because that's the hottest month of the year. We're, we, we're in that hottest month of the year. Uh, and that's when we consume the most because most of our consumption is in the air conditioning. Conditioning those spaces, fighting the sun and the external heat to maintain uh, lab quality, library quality, and data quality conditions. So that, that's the point of this slide. Uh, you can see that usually our lowest day is actually on the 1st, uh, January 1st, because it, nobody's here and it's cool. Uh, but this year was a little different because of COVID. And you can see that the COVID impact there. And I get into more of that later if you uh, go to the next slides. Uh, yeah, so there it is. HVAC is consuming all the energy and uh, if you if I plot the outdoor air temperature, peak outdoor air temperature against our peak demand per month, you can see that it just it just follows it because that's what it's doing with all of our energy, not all of it, but quite a bit of it, most of it is going into cooling, fighting that that sun and fighting the external temperature. Uh, next slide. This is another interesting little known fact is that uh, Manoa. Uh, has what we call district cooling loop. So, so for any like campus or like a, a base or something like that, uh, they build these and they have these district um, cooling and, and heating loops. So they have underground piping connecting uh, buildings and they have a central like, you know, heating or cooling facility to provide heat to all these um, buildings on the campus. And you'll find that sort of like, you know, all over. Uh, we don't heat, we, we cool. And so uh, we have um, these district cooling loops and there's five of them. And what's interesting here is that um, we have these anchor facilities. So if kind of zoom, can we zoom in on the, on the map there? So in the case of that red loop C, Biomed, Biomed uh, produces all the coolness for its recipient buildings which are um, listed out there as uh, under loop C, kind of hard to read, but anyway, there's um, Egg Engineering, St. John, Sherman Labs, and Moore Hall are recipients. So even though the energy is being consumed at a certain building, it's doing the work for these other recipient buildings. But this district cooling uh, turns out to be one of the most um, efficient ways to cool uh, multiple buildings at this scale. Uh, you know, on a campus, and that's why people do it. So, so what's the age? What's the age of the loops themselves, and the and the plumbing that goes in? Are they fairly modern, or are they old, and are you going to have to replace them, or is there any heat loss, uh, or heat gain as you as you you know pipe this around the campus? Yeah, um, it's interesting. The pipes are insulated; they're buried and they're insulated. Um, there is loss in the line. There's loss in in everything, as you know, Mitch. Um, it it's, turns out that for the amount of cooling that we do, it is probably more efficient than putting window units in every space. Uh, the comparison is like the comparison uh, of a bus to, a, to an EV. So one guy gets on a bus and one guy gets in his little smart car, the two-seater smart car. They drive to the North Shore, right? 
which one used less energy? Well, the little smart car, of course. But you put 40 guys in the bus and 40 smart cars, which one uses less energy? Right. The bus. So that's what these are. These cooling loops are buses. They're made to do a lot of work, cool enormous buildings 24 7 and, and reliably because you can't have an air conditioning system fail because if it fails, the lab space, the, con the, the, the controlled area, you know, warms up, all sorts of bad things happen and research goes out the door. So they, not only do they have to be, um, you know, have to perform, they have to, uh, they have to perform all the time, you know, reliably. Right. So that's, that's, a, that's a big challenge to it when you have a research um, facility Right. Uh, as far as the age of them goes, there's there's a there's been an evolution. Uh, you know, there was a building boom in the camp at the campus in the 70s. Um, uh, a lot of these loops were installed in that time frame. Um, they have been maintained, upgraded, connected, reconfigured, improved uh, throughout the years, and there are many stories on that on the website, by the way, that talk about uh, all of these endeavors. Uh, very interesting stuff. I uh, won't get into it now, but uh, I, I encourage you all to go and visit hawaii.edu slash sustainability and look at the energy section under efficiency, and you can read about all the wonderful things that our facility seems have done throughout the years. Okay. Yep. So I don't know if there's another slide. Yep. There you go. Okay, yeah. So this is an extension of those cooling loops. You got the the, the, those loops that I showed on the last that map um, are represented by those five sort of lines at the top, which, which are actually 25. There's 25 buildings within those five lines. And, the, and the, the next 20, these are like the top consumers from AWH are listed below that. What's really interesting is if you look at the use type column, which is the first column, just read them out loud, research, 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 research. Okay, well, there's one office, and then there's research, IT, athletics, library. You know, it's a, not classrooms. Like you said earlier, it isn't the classrooms that are using all the energy. It's, it's the research spaces, the things that make the university amazing, the things that make that attract people to the university. Is that it is a research university which attracts, you know, high-powered um, uh, professors and researchers and lecturers, and that's that's what makes a university. And, and and the money and funding that follows them, because if you don't have top level researchers, you're not going to get top level funding either. And of course, the overhead uh, costs help fund the university. So it's a it's a uh, basically an economic engine. Yeah, and it's weird if you don't have the research space, you can't get the research grant. And so that space needs to be climate controlled and to just apply for the for the research dollars. Right. Um, so yeah, that's that's a interesting and little known fun fact. But you can see right there, summarized at the top, forty five largest energy users of campus: research, IT, libraries, athletics. Right. Yeah. Next slide. So this is interesting that not everybody knows either, and this is the month by month kilowatt hour consumption versus cost uh, plot that I did, and you can see that sometimes the consumption goes down. But the cost goes up. That means our bill actually went up. Even though we use less, our bill actually was higher than last month. And sometimes we use more, but the bill goes down. So we have these two things that are sort of fluctuating independent of each other. Who knows what makes the bill go up and down? I, I don't know. But have to get Hiko on your show to answer that question, maybe. Okay. But, uh, but next, yeah, next slide, please. And then, uh, oh, here's, yeah, this is that slide on COVID energy impact that kind of extended it into FY21 here. But you could see the previous year is sort of the trend and you could see it, you know, the trend is getting lower and lower each year because we're putting more solar and more efficiency. The COVID really tilted it uh, way down there and you can see it's still sort of hovering sort of low at the time of this report uh, due to COVID effects. I mean, the campus was shut down. But ironically, we actually, um, a lot of the eateries and the cookeries, they weren't in operation. There was all, all the housing was down. 
and um, a lot of the classroom buildings that were maybe recipient buildings, we were able to turn off their ACs to work on them. We used it as an opportunity to fix them and, and introduce a little bit more efficiency into them uh, while nobody was there. So, as, so you're kind of seeing the, the effect of us taking advantage of the shutdown to perform maintenance, but it showed up pretty well in the energy data. Uh, so yeah, the That's next slide. Interesting. Yeah, the, the, the first one I showed you about the fluctuation is month to month. This is year to year. And you can see each year we buy less and less from HECO. And each year we pay more and more from HECO to HECO. Uh, the, the orange line is our bill and the blue line is our consumption, which is weird. You, you think if you use less, wouldn't you pay less? But no, because the eco, uh, they they adjust their rates every year to, to stay sort of you know healthy. As more and more people put solar on the roof, and more and more people you know whatever they, they sell less kilowatt hours, they have to crank up the rate of that to get um, you know meet their bottom line. But plus the energy is getting more expensive, right? We're moving from cheap coal to more desirable uh, you know renewable sources. So that's um, and I don't know, I don't know what goes into it, but that's just, I'm just plotting what the bill says. But if you hadn't reduced your uh, usage rate or your consumption, the cost would have been off the charts. Like, I mean, it would have been interesting to do a chart to say, gee, if we hadn't done this, how much would we have been paying? That would be an interesting chart. Yeah, I should do that. Next show. <laughs> well, you substantiate why you're investing this money. Yeah. energy efficiency and, and new systems and new equipment and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, so. one of the big, one of the big, you know, it's not just cost, right? Because the true cost, as you know, is the environment, you know, sea level rise, global warming. And so yeah. being a part of sustainability, um, I have to remind everybody that that's the hidden cost. So we could sign a value to that. What would it be? You know, so it's, it's, it's uh, anyway, um, just thought I'd, I'd plug that yeah. sustainability plug. <laughs> yeah, so this is something uh, that we, we've added to that website, and this is sort of the cumulative um, annual savings for efficiency projects. So, like, you do an efficiency project one year, and you kind of get the savings from that every year. You know what I mean? So, if you stack up yeah. all the efficiency projects that, that we've done for all of these years, uh, you, you know, they've stacked up to about 7 million kilowatt hours of savings at the Manoa campus alone. And uh, you can go to visit that URL at the bottom there of that slide, and you can see and read about all the wonderful efficiency projects that we did at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And, uh, you know, each one individually. And this includes um, chiller replacements, which are huge. Lighting upgrades, you walk around campus, you see all the new LED lights and more to come. Uh, we replaced uh, uh, ultra low temperature freezers. One of these freezers cools the specimens to negative 80 degrees. Um, wow. And, and that's for like, you know, cancer cultures and things like that. You kind of have to preserve these things. Um, and they're mission critical to a lot of the bio uh, research, biotech that we're doing. At the campus, and each one of these freezers uses as much as an entire house. Each one, and there's hundreds of them. And so we um, we started a program to replace them all with uh, Energy Star certified. And these freezers are expensive, and so they're handed down from researcher to researcher as the researchers cycle through and they move on and go work for Pfizer or whatever. But um, but the freezers stay. And so we have last, you know, 20 year old technology in our facilities that we've, we've started a program and we replaced all of them with uh, ones that consume uh, a third of what the old ones consume. Right. So we're looking forward to, uh, uh, you know, publishing some of the energy savings from that um, and, 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 other, and other things that we're doing um, for energy efficiency. But yeah, this so is this your is last. Uh, this is your last information slide, other than your Mahalo slide. So, 
yeah so so this is it and so you know we're continuing to build out an additional four megawatts uh at manoa we have an energy savings performance contract which is what the community colleges did uh we're starting one up here at manoa um we're uh optimizing our lead credits for um around energy performance um and we uh are developing a strategic energy management plan that uh, you know includes a PV power plant study. How much PV do you need to zero the campus, and where would you put it? And then um, energy optimization modeling. Uh, you know what assets do you invest in at which time? For the most bang for your buck. Uh, we got a PV farm that we've um, that we're developing at uh, UH West Oahu to feed Pico's grid. We're just a landowner, but we're helping. The state achieve its uh, you know net zero goals, and then we have a few programs with um, with Hico and you know, our facilities guys are always doing projects to boost our efficiency, which I talked about already in great length. And so there it is again, the URL. One last plug: Hawaii.edu sustainability slash energy. Go there. Lots of good information. If you watch this show, you'll probably really love that website. Okay, so the last slide, uh, please. That's this is how you can contact Miles personally. And it gives his uh, email address and his uh, telephone number. So I have yep. uh, one final question, and we have about half a minute left, a minute left. So taking everything and distilling it down, Miles, you know, what is the one single biggest barrier or problem that you have in implementing all these projects? Because this is a huge management problem. You're, installing PV everywhere. They're all big projects, lots of contract work. You know, if you had to wave your magic wand, what would be the one thing that would help you go further, faster, cheaper? Yeah, I guess the one thing is that, you know, in it's 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 funding really and 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 PV is like when we build new buildings, often PV is um, or renewable energy is not part of the planning of, of that. So, you know, when it comes to energy, we just kind of, well, we'll go buy a pico. That's the solution. But when we, when we build a building, you know, it, in, in my opinion, it comes with a front door. It comes with a fire alarm system. It comes with, an, a, a te, you know, a telecommunications system. It comes with a security system. It comes with a sewer system. It comes with an electrical distribution system. It comes with a HVAC system. It should come with a renewable energy system. It, it really right. should just be a part of it and not an add-on, not something you can value engineer out. It needs to be a part of the thought process, the funding, the estimates, the estimates, uh, everything. It's, it's, um, as long as we kind of say, well, we'll do that later, we're just going to kick the can down the road. So. Uh, I told in the legislative briefing, um, you know, what we can do is we can make a law that requires every state building to maximize its PV, and we can fund it. So, right. so that that would be, you know, my that would be the one thing that I could do. Okay. Well, great job, uh, Miles. I uh, really appreciate you uh, coming on my show today. And so we're going to leave it there. You've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii. And today we've been honored to have uh, be updated on the University of Hawaii's net zero program with Miles Topping, the UH Director of Energy Management. So thank you so much for participating, Miles. Thank you, and, it was a pleasure. Yeah, and thanks to our viewers for tuning in. I'm Mitch Ewan. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha.